My name is Wandia Gishuru and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Vivo. Vivo started initially with a focus on activewear, fitness, dance, things like that. Uh, but very quickly we pivoted to just providing regular clothing, um, but clothing that was tailored to fit this market. So it's clothing that is comfortable, that fits the body shapes and sizes of, uh, of women on the continent. And I think uh, designing and producing and selling to women just came naturally. My co-founder co and I are both female. Um, we, we understand to a certain extent the target market that we're trying to reach. Um, so we were sort of meeting a need that we ourselves had, that our friends had, that our children had. Um, so it was very easy. That's not to say that we will never do anything for men because I think, <laughs> I think that uh, men also are, are becoming a lot more creative, are willing to be a little, take a bit more risks in what they're wearing. I see, I see younger men, younger Kenyan men now playing a lot more with colors and prints. And, and so there's a lot of exciting stuff that you can do for men as well. We've grown, you know, relatively quickly. I think we believe there's always space to grow more, grow faster. Um, so in eight years, we've gone from one store to 14 stores. And now we're really excited about the fact that we're doing a lot more online as well. So we're really offering, you know, a, a more of an omni-channel um, product range because you can buy online, you can buy in store, you can have it delivered to your home. I mean, we're just trying to be as flexible as possible and just meet the client where, they, where they're at and what, what they want, yeah. Unfortunately, the, the, the fashion industry in Kenya really collapsed in the 70s, 80s. Um, I would say primarily because of the flood of Mitumba onto the market. Uh, and so for a long time, there were generations of people who grew up never seeing ready-to-wear clothing that was available at scale that was made locally. And so... To a certain extent, I feel our impact has been to just remind people that it's possible. Um, and we hope that's the impact because we want to see many other brands coming up. We want to see Kenyans dressing themselves again. Uh, we, want to, we want to see the, the value that the fashion industry captures being captured by us and not necessarily only by foreign brands or only by secondhand clothing. I think there's space for every, all of those, but the space that we should own, um, you know, of brands, Kenyan brands that are owned by Kenyans, designed for Kenyans, sold to Kenyans, I think we're only scratching the surface. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a basic right. I mean, being dressed is a basic need. Why should we outsource it? I think the fact that our product has been so well received by curvy women, women of, you know, uh, different shapes and sizes is because of the fact that we have outsourced our fashion, which means that the clothing you get here is clothing that was never designed for this market. It's clothing that was designed for an Asian market or a European market or an American market. They don't look like us. They're not shaped like us. So of course we're going to struggle. So when you, when you have a product, that's the power of a local brand is you can design something that fits. Um, and so I think what, what we'd like to be able to do is bring, bring the offering to, to fit the client in whatever shape they come in. You know, I get asked quite often whether, um, you know, the fact that we make locally, is that a selling point? Is that something that people value and will pay money for? I, I do think there's a growing interest. Um, there's a lot of pride. Uh, with the younger generations in particular, they're like, yeah, let's buy our product, let's, you know, wear Kenyan and wear it proudly. Um, I, I don't think that should give us an excuse not to, not to meet the standard. I don't think you should expect people to pay more or that they should accept a lower quality. So our challenge as, as a sector is to really continue to compete because the international brands will come, they're here, they'll keep coming. Sometimes their prices will be far better because they can produce at a scale uh, that is very hard when you're, <laughs> when you're just in, in Kenya. Um, so we just, you know, we want to be able to keep offering something that's a little more unique, that's a bit more tailored, that fits a little better, 
um, and that speaks to people, you know. And I think that's the importance of brands, because Mutumba is not a brand. It's an offering. It's affordable. It's accessible. But you can never know what you'll find. You can you can go to the a website or an Instagram page and see, you know, ten thousand styles. Um, but when you go to the market, you have to look through all those styles. And yes, you'll find one or two great things, uh, but you must go through a lot in order to get that. And so what we want is brands that you can, from the comfort of your home, get onto your phone, look at what's there, and then make an order and have it delivered. The same way you can order pizza. Why can't you order that dress that you're, that you're seeing, you know, on a, on a nicely curated page? Um, so my, my, my dream uh, is that th there are at least 30, 40 strong Kenyan fashion brands that are dominating this space, competing against the international brands, and at a price that's affordable. Um, and so when you walk into a Two Rivers or a Sarit Center, half of those shops should be Kenyan brands. Because we have everything it takes. We have the capacity to produce, we have the capacity to design, we have marketing capacity and knowledge, we have sales, we have after sales, customer service. There's nothing we're lacking. A dress that is made in Kenya will, compared to a Mutumba, for example, dress, will create 16 times more jobs. We've done the numbers. 16 times more formal jobs. Jobs where people can get a salary, a payslip, go to a bank, open up an account, borrow money against their, their income. Those 16 times more of those jobs. We contribute 20 times more revenue to the government. You know, the kind of taxes that we'll pay. We pay. We pay when we have to import the fabric. We pay when we, when we pay someone's salary. We're paying PAYE. We're paying uh, VAT on every sale. We're paying tax if we... <laughs> You're paying. And it's okay. But let that same government then support the local industry. I think the fact, the fact that we have managed to create a lot of jobs, I think right now we're probably at about 150 people, um, is one of the things that excites us the most. And, you know, especially in spaces where people were struggling to find work. Uh, people, there are a lot of people who study fashion. There's so many schools of fashion, you know, uh, degrees at universities. And then they graduate and it's like, where do we work? Um, so they have to either create their own brands, which is okay, but for someone who's just starting out, that's not easy. So we, we've been able to offer internships, attachments, permanent, you know, contracts, long-term contracts and everything. Uh, so that's been amazing. The fact that we hire mostly women, I would say, is one of the largest groups within our, our uh, workforce is the sales team. So the people who are dealing face-to-face -face with clients, our clients are all women or 90% women. Uh, so I think it came naturally. I think the fact that we're on, we're doing production, so a lot of the people who, are, who sit behind the machines and the machine operators also tend to be women in the textile industry. So again, but you know, we don't only have women. I think there are at least 30, maybe 35% men, uh, but it's okay. I think I'm also quite proud of the fact that we're a brand that has grown and been built predominantly by women, you know? So when we're thinking of growth strategy, it's, there are lots of women around that table, at the table. <laughs> so there's some men too. Yeah. I'm very plugged in on the marketing front and also in the design front, trying to come up with designs for some of the products that we have for our clients. Um, and then trying to create content that will speak to our clients. I, I really love that creative aspect. Um, I like the people interaction, working closely with the marketing team, with the sales team, um, with the customer experience team as well. It's amazing. That's, that's, that's part of the reason that I love working at Vivo um, and also just inspiring women. Women, and, and I mean, this is an opinion, so not everyone might agree with this, but I feel like women, uh, we have to, we have to push up against a lot of even internal limitations, you know? We, we hold ourselves back. We're shy, we're, we're afraid to, you know, you know, to 
make mistakes. Um, we're afraid to be assertive. Uh, we, we, we're afraid to outshine men. <laughs> uh, we, we're afraid often of public speaking and of speaking loud. Because, you know, sometimes unintentionally, we've heard these messages from when we're young, like, sit, sit nicely, be quiet, you know, don't be so, I mean, many times, even now, I have people who work, who work on the team and they'll be like, hey, but Fontia is more like a dude, you know, she's, <laughs> she thinks like a man, she acts like, and I'm like, really? <laughs> but it's because, I, I think partly because I grew up with only brothers. So I wasn't going to be left behind. I learned from a very young age that if, if I'm going to be heard, I have to speak as loud as them. I have to not be afraid. I have to show them I'm not afraid even if you bully me, you know? So, so for me, it's natural. I'm quite comfortable in a room full of men. I'll even forget that I'm the only woman in the room. But I think that's not true for everybody. So I think as, and I don't even want necessarily to see women taking over. I just think we, we, we're half the population. We should be represented equally. What I've learned from Wendia, I like the fact that she's a risk taker. I like the fact that she's very bold about, you know, what she wants. She's very hardworking, you know, jokes aside, it's work. And um, she just wants the best for this company and the best for the customers outside there. Her thought process and I've learned a lot about like how to run a business, strategic thinking, uh, design thinking and how, to, how everything fits together and how you have to look at the bigger picture of the company um, even as you run your own department. You know when you see things like when you see a flight a Boeing 7 whatever 37 flown by only women, only women, you know it's, Images like that to younger people, we think it's wow, to them it's like, yeah, it's normal and it becomes normal. And so when they see a female president, it's not, it's not a shock to them. That's where we need to get to, where we don't even need to have this conversation, you know, because we're seeing as many women as men. And so it's like now nobody says, wow, can you imagine women wear trousers? What do you think of that? It's normal, you know? So it should become like that, like where it's so normal to see Companies run by women, top women, half, you know, half the C-suite women. It shouldn't even be a conversation. Most people, and what I've read even from global, you know, sort of leaders and stuff like that, give a woman the chance and you will rarely regret it because they will work twice as hard, you know. So, but they need to be allowed in the door. it's a Kenyan brand we have to support ourselves first our own and then you know and then the rest of the world can also buy into um, what cool stuff we're doing here in Kenya and not to mention we design specifically for the Kenyan woman so we'll look at all body shapes sizes um, sometimes the colors we use we look at skin tone what works well with particular fabrics and so it's very um, intentional so that's what I love about the brand I look for inspiration from a lot of places, so I, I, I read quite a lot, I listen to a lot of TED Talks and podcasts and um, I think as I've gotten older I have less time somehow <laughs> to sit and read a book, so I'll, these days I listen more, I'll, just, you know, I'll go for a walk and put a podcast on, but when I was younger I used to read much more and I started reading Maya Angelou's books um, in my early 20s. You know, I read her whole, the whole series of her, her autobiographies and I just loved her. And, you know, as she got older, she seemed to, she seemed to be, you know, she got wiser and wiser. And then, of course, I started watching Oprah, again, from a very young age. I mean, I think I was in university when Oprah first became really popular and I would watch her shows and it was just fascinating. And again, she's evolved, you know, so what was in the beginning was more entertainment. Now it's a lot more meaning, purpose, you know, really trying to sort of lift, lift people up. And so the kind of people she interviews, where she's putting her energy and her, her time, her resources, um, you know, has become more and more inspiring. I think Michelle, I must say that it took me a while to get to like Michelle because I was jealous. <laughs> like, how can you be married to Barack? And then... <laughs> because I had such a crush on Barack. 
but I, uh, I think the more that I, I, I would listen to her and watch their relationship, I mean, of course, it's what you see from a distance, but it seems like it's just such a beautiful friendship, such mutual respect, um, strong, unapologetic woman who's not trying to fit into any mold, but is willing to speak up when it's important, calls out the issues that need to be addressed, you know, I have women in my own life who are as strong, as beautiful, as inspiring. But, you know, they're not as well known. So when we're thinking about what kind of posters to put up there, of course, you want to put people that are known. And, you know, I'm, I mean, I, it's just that we're still decorating. But soon you're going to see more Kenyan women, African women. I mean, we've got Mandela somewhere. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, so it's not only outside. I, th I think there's so much inspiration on the continent as well, yeah. I think what I like about anything creative is the process of having or watching an idea turn into a reality. And it may sound crazy because we've all worn clothes all our lives, but I hadn't really paid attention to the process of you have an idea, you sketch something, then you have a two-dimensional fabric and then you cut it and it's almost like a puzzle and then you put it together and the next thing you can wear it and, and, and it's very quick so there's you know in the clothing space the time from you know cutting fabric to seeing a dress can be an hour and then you have something to wear you know uh, and and as opposed to, because when we first, first started the business, I used, we used to import finished product. Um, it, was, it was interesting, but it's, you know, this just opens your mind. It's like, let's try this, maybe that, you know, let's experiment. Let's, um, let's see what can come out of doing it this way. And so uh, you, I, I find it's the one time that I can get lost. You know, I can forget. I can forget it's lunchtime. I can forget to eat. <laughs> I can forget it's time to go home. I can forget that there's no one around. Like suddenly, you know, it will be quiet and I'll be like, oh my gosh, everyone has gone and I'm still, you know, thinking. So I think they call that being in the zone or in the flow. Um, and they say that's when you're most present because the only thing that matters is what's right there, right in front of you. And you're not worrying about what happened yesterday or thinking about tomorrow, you're just in the moment. And, and people get there in different ways. I think they say people get there with sport or prayer or meditation. And for me, it's one of the ways that, that I can get into the flow. I think you, when people ask about highlights, they're thinking for something big, you know, big, big achievements. I, you know, obviously there've been some really you know, wonderful achievements. We got, uh, we came number two in a, in a top 100 award sort of ceremony last year, uh, KPMG event. We've won the Kenyan Fashion Awards twice um, in the past. And those are really nice, but I think, I think I, I enjoy the little achievements almost more. Like this, you know, today when I walked into work, the team that uh, manages the online e-commerce side of things you know, I could see them just smiling. I'm like, hey guys, they're like, we met our target. <laughs> like they had a, you know, they had a monthly target and they, they exceeded it and they were so excited. And, you know, it's seeing that, it's seeing sort of people feeling accomplished, feeling like they're, they're you know, they're happy or they're enjoying what they're doing. It's not always like that. Of course, there are days when everyone's stressed and everyone's feeling pressure and maybe they, you know, they're like, ah, oh, I don't know if I want to do this, but it's not all the time. And, and yeah, I think when, when you see that satisfaction um, from our employees, from, from our, with our clients, you know, when you, see, when you see someone saying, oh my God, I found a dress, I love it. You know, I took it, I wore it the other day. My kids were like, hey, is that you? You know, those kind of moments, those for me are really, yeah, they're as, they're as exciting as getting an award. You know, I'm getting older, so I should be thinking about legacy. Those are, those are good questions. I think, I think if I could 
genuinely play a part in, like I said, claiming back the fashion industry, not just in, Ken in Kenya, but on the continent. And if I could be instrumental, and you know, none of these things will ever be one person. So if I can be part of an effort, a combined effort to, to start to see how the continent can look at ourselves as one big market, because then we can get the volumes. Then we can, you know, if we can start trading between different African countries, we, we can, Kenyans can be wearing styles that were made in Rwanda or in Angola or Nigeria, and, and it's easy, it's affordable, because that's how Europe succeeded. That's how the US succeeded, because they've got a huge market. That's how China is doing so well. Do you know we'll have more people than China in about 10, 15 years? So why, why don't we see that as the opportunity? Um, I looked at, I looked at a, an article the other day and they were looking at some of the, the sort of wealthiest companies or the biggest, you know, out there. And in the top 10, I think three were in the textile space. You know, where are these strong Kenyan or African fashion brands? It doesn't, whether it's one that I have a share of or not is not the point. It's just like, you know, we see a few out of South Africa and they've come here, they've done well, it's great, Mr. Price, Woolworths, and you know, we're happy. But where are the Kenyan ones? Where are the Ethiopian ones? Where are the Ugandan ones? Um, and can they grow and scale to a point where, you know, they've, they've, they'll be known a hundred years from now? So we can only do what we can in the time that we're given. So in the few more years that I might have on Vivo, because I don't think I'll be here forever, I hope that's the kind of difference that I can make. And be on Vivo as well. My advice would be start somewhere, start small, try, look at every challenge as feedback. It's feedback for what can work, what can't work, what people like, what they don't like. It's hard because sometimes there's difficult moments and you'll just want to give up. But if you can keep going, then that difficult moment, it's like you're banking lessons for your future. Do you know what I mean? It's an investment. Your challenges become your treasure of lessons. Uh, and so don't take things too personally. Most people are, even when they're giving you bad feedback, it's not about you. <laughs> it may be about your product and your service, and sometimes it's about you too, but take what you can, learn from, learn from that, and keep going. Um, I think most businesses succeed because they've managed to stay alive long enough to figure out exactly what works yeah so that con you're constantly iterating you're constantly evolving based on that feedback you're getting so yeah I mean I could go on I mean obviously it depends on the industry and the person and blah 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 and there's no one right answer so figuring out what works best for you not everybody is uh, necessarily cut out for self for self-employment or for entrepreneurship I think uh, you can find a very passion, you can fulfill your passions even as an employee.